All right, guys, just another second. If you're here uh, watching this in the guild, do give it a little like or emoji so I know um, that you can see this. And I'm checking the guild to make sure it is live right now. And then otherwise, those of you who have joined live are over here in the um, go to meeting interface. Okay, I see everything is working there. And audio is going. All right. All right, thank you so much, Tyler, for, for joining. Yeah, no problem. All right, so um, I'm going to uh, ask Tyler a few questions, guys, get a sense of of, um, of what he does and, and all of that. And I have one big question that I'm going to ask right off the bat. Uh, and then uh, we're going to open this up for Q&A. Um, Tyler's an environment artist over at Sucker Punch. Is that where you're still at, Tyler? Uh, yeah, that's where I'm still at. Okay, great. Uh, do you work next to Melissa? I do, yeah. Uh, tell her uh, I said hello. She is um, a, definitely well a pure gem. Yeah, she's great. <laughs> yeah, she's got to be great energy. I remember her at uh, in school. Actually, she was just always, always positivity. Oh yeah, yeah yeah. All right. So um, if you've got questions, start shouting them out. Uh, Tyler's an environment artist, but let's start with the first question. There's not a lot of environment art here, Tyler. What's going on? There's not. Um, it's all a lot of Yeah. So <laughs> mainly what I'm listing there is my uh, professional uh, uh, my professional job. Yeah. And uh, that's mainly been what I've consisted of in my, uh, in my career. It's been building environments for hard surface and uh, organic uh, environments as well. But yep. uh, when I get off the clock, when I go home, um, what you're seeing here on my art station is kind of what I do uh, in my spare time. Mm -hmm. um, I love it because it's just me doing my personal, uh, just illustrative work. Uh, I can just be my own uh, art director on it. And yeah. so what you're seeing on my art station mainly consists of uh, what I'm doing uh, outside of work. But when I'm working, uh, it's, yeah, it's mainly, um, all the uh, factors that go into building environment art, that is um, working with the designers, uh, working with the gameplay, making sure it's fun, and then building the art assets around that, um, and uh, working with the limitations of uh, what the texture budget is, what the uh, memory is, what uh, collision um, limitations are uh, presented in the environment. Mm -hmm. um, another big reason why I like to, you know, uh, partake in the creature illustration you're seeing on my art station is that I can kind of just let go and just focus on the art. Yeah, that's great. But what I love about this is, you know, especially when people are beginning, they're they're thinking, okay, I like to do character, so I'm going to be a character artist. Um, right. Or I like to do environment, I'm going to be in it. So it's very personal. It's like, I, I like it, I'll do it. But most right. of the people I know, it's like, you know, number one, get the job, you know, so you so you eat. Right, that's the key. Yeah. Eat and pay rent, <laughs> and then, yeah. and then it's like you know, this is just you know, start to do your thing. And every artist I know, they it's there is the day job, there is the the night to some extent. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, is that something that you're experiencing too? It's like this is the day job, this is the thing that I really like. Yeah, definitely. Um, I actually scrolled all the way down to. Yeah, um, show the first pieces these are what you're seeing here stuff back in like 2013 mm -hmm. way back in 2013 <laughs> and yep. uh uh so you do see some illustrative stuff uh still because um i was mentoring it uh getting mentored at the time and trying yep. to figure out what it is i uh, wanted to do but um moving up here you can see uh some of the environment work uh i was doing for this uh project that unfortunately got canceled but uh, it was a lot of it was a lot of fun to do oh um, man that's an amazing was, door yeah yeah we were doing a lot of uh dark gothic uh castlevania style uh -huh. um, castlevania style work and uh this was some of this is in CryEngine, and some of this is in uh, ue4 uh. Uh, we switched engines halfway through <laughs> which is always fun and uh so then uh having all the pieces uh jump from one engine to another is always kind of jarring but yeah. Uh, so there was mainly that work. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, one of the feedback, uh, some of the feedback I get on my portfolio is just like, so you've been in the industry for a while, but I'm not seeing a lot of uh, titles on here. And I've just kind of had, um, unfortunately, when I get on a project, either um, it stays under NDA for a very, very, very long time, or um, 
the project um, peters out and uh, I've been jumping onto another project. And um, so mainly what I've been working on is um, I worked on Star Citizen a little bit. Unfortunately, I can't show any of that. Um, Revival, what I just showed you there, um, which uh, we got to show after the uh, project, unfortunately, kind of fell through. Yeah. Um, Friday the 13th art, uh, uh, and I was working on uh, the Friday the 13th game and also working on this um, uh, personal project with uh, my CEO uh, that unfortunately petered out and um, kind of turned into a passion project of my own, is, uh, and that's what you're kind of seeing on all over my art station a bit. Mm. And uh, mainly what I was doing um, with Friday the 13th was just... Um, uh, working with the uh, character uh, riggers and um, the character art to um, yeah. help touch up and fix um, problems with uh, the rigging, the character, the uh, overall art direction of all the camp counselors and Jasons and stuff like that. Oh, 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 oh. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, that's, uh, that was a very great lesson with, um, and, and let me know too, if I get too much on a tangent and you want to uh, veer the conversation back to uh, another I'm question. Huge, but uh, I'm a huge fan of tangents. We're, we're an artist all right. here. Right on. Yeah. Um, one uh, with you mentioning uh, character art, uh, working on Friday the Thirteenth was a very um, good lesson as far as what the day-to-day -day, um, job of a character artist is. Mm -hmm. It's not really making pretty ZBrush sculptures. Yeah. Um, it's it's about twenty percent that. Um, then eighty percent is, hey, the topology of this guy's shoulders on his totally. Letterman jacket is not working with our rig. Um, we need to redo them. Bug. Or, uh, hey, the UVs got janked on uh, when we re-rigged this guy. <laughs> uh, we need to go uh, find an older model, copy those UVs, cross our fingers, paste them back. It's, it's a lot of, um, uh, when you're a character artist, it mainly consists of uh, the technical uh, layout of getting the character to work with different costumes, with different um, customization, usually, especially yeah. like in an RPG or something like that. Um, and lots and lots and lots of clothing. Um, it's it's I'd say like most of the industry is not you're not so much a character artist as you are a clothing and marvelous designer artist uh, at least from my experience. Mm -hmm. um, it mainly consists of understanding folds, understanding clothing, really knowing marvelous designer super super well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, uh, that's yeah, that's, that's a great point though to to keep in mind because for me I talk to the boot campers and the to my people a lot about this idea that we people get into character and they get into a lot of this thinking that, you know, I'm going to learn ZBrush and do it right. Like ZBrush is the gateway drug. Right. But, but there's a lot harder core things that you have to do, you know, and it's oh, that's yeah. just the beginning. You know, I was talking to Josh Herman about this and he was, they actually plotted it out at cloud Imperium. You know, what are all the steps that they have to do? And ZBrush became one eighth of mm -hmm. the entire equation. And oh, yeah. everything, uh, everything else is marvelous. There's topology, there's UVs, there's the, there's, it, there's so much more, you know, substance, mm -hmm. you know, substance does a lot of stuff that before people would use ZBrush for. So, yeah, yeah. There's for all the procedural um, systems mm -hmm. uh, uh, involving the character to, you know, get covered in blood, covered in mud, get mm -hmm. wet, um, all, all get dusty, all that stuff um, involves, um, a lot of substance designer and uh, procedural based. Um, uh, not, not granted, it's like you're taking all the information out of the um, uh, normal map and AO map that you sculpted, um, and then uh, seeing how you can seep uh, the effects into it. Um, yeah. and, uh, going back to Friday the 13th, another big factor was um, all the dismemberment. <laughs> we had lots of uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. lots of meetings about how do we chop off all these limbs? How do we, um, you know? <laughs> How do we? Uh, That's awesome. Get, you know, how do we get all these blood effects? Working with the VFX team and everything, and uh, yeah, just uh, having a system that works across the board for every um, for every character. And another thing I'd say for a character artist is um, make absolutely sure that the communication of um, the UV layout, the topology uh, language that the studio is using. Um, is consistent because uh, there's nothing worse, and uh, I've had to, I've had to deal with this where um, you get a bunch of different uh, contractors, and they all um, did the topology on the uh, bodies or the faces in a different way. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, character uh, rigger is uh, character animator slash technical animator is just like we built one rig system to work with this kind of topology, so this topology is not going to work. Um, or it's not going to fit within, you know, our system where we have this second round of you, uh, the second layer of UVs that uh, 
that's where all our blood effects kick in. And uh, I, I don't know too if I'm 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 being too abstract or like I need to like delve more into like well, Tyler, what are you talking about? Yeah, don't <laughs> let, let, let me know. This is good. This um, is a good general kind of conversation to kind of like for me. Yeah. The thing that's interesting about what you're saying is, and uh, you guys the, who are here in the live one, what what is it that's valuable? What did you What are you learning about this conversation? In fact, you know what, um, Tyler, give me one second because I want to stop and I sure, want yeah. everybody here to tell me what are you finding valuable in this. I have my idea, but I, you know, I don't want to put my thoughts on you guys. I want to hear what you think. So, uh, Jan is saying he's learning how the industry works. Uh, Adam, I love the info on effects, layers, blood, wet, etc. All right, keep coming, guys. You know me. I'm not going to let you just slide by a couple of you answering. I want to hear answers from everyone. Uh, Adam's asking for actually any visuals you have of that. Of, you know, uh, how you cut I, things might be able to, I might be able to get something. Okay. Um, it's going to be in UE4, um, actually. But I think uh, I'll be able to throw a little something together uh, okay. while I'm talking. All right. And, uh, Danny, I love the info regarding how character work is different from what people expect. Yeah. Isaac, Ira, Jane, Kyle, what are you guys hearing? Adam Marmoset can't do that as far as I know. Correct me if I'm wrong. The cutting up stuff. Uh, Aaron, the general character pipeline and program use. Danny, what other Danny Squid? What? You got me there, Danny. I'm lost. Uh, Santi, interesting to hear about the process different from ZBrush. What Danny said. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Cheyenne, the workflow and always be ready to change stuff. Kyle, uh, very interesting what the actual industry is like. I wish someone would have told me this about the architecture world sooner. Yeah, Kyle's uh, uh, from the in architecture industry. And art their, like that education of architects, I think, is almost criminal in terms of, right. um, you know, they delude them to think it's design. And then you basically are set down in a world where everything's building codes. Yeah, um, unless you're working for a crazy like billionaire entrepreneur yeah. um yeah it's it's very much like here's you know here's how it works in the most efficient way uh and here's how you but that's kind of interesting in a way it's sidestepping into um yep in my current job um i i unfortunately i'm under pretty strict nda so i can't talk too much about my current sure. job but other um uh instances where very much of what being an environment artist is, is working with limitations and seeing what creative opportunities you can get from that. And usually what that consists of is um, the designers come to you with, uh, here's a gray box room. Um, here's the base collision of where the character can go and where the character can't go. And that's not going to change because you can create your beautiful corner like portfolio piece of like a hallway yeah. where it's just like, look at all these cables, look at all, you know, <laughs> or like a forest. It's just like, look at all this crazy, crunchy rock detail and yeah. the designer would come back like well that's great um that's gonna be impossible to i you know have the character ik step all over that um you get you know you get essentially this gray box room or you get you know this very pillowy marshmallowy looking terrain and you need to work with that yeah um and so with that you try to find that balance of, you know, gameplay is always king uh always going into the industry i don't think i've been at a studio where it's not it needs to be fun and that's always priority. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fun to get around, it's fun to play in. And then it's a sense of, uh, okay, where uh, where can we work with limitations of, okay, we can't add polygons to this because the character needs to walk across it smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, but how can we indicate that this is a rocky slope or that this is a cluttered attic or this is, you know, um, and it can get pretty challenging sometimes. I mean, if you're looking at like a screen covered mountain slope, uh, or something like that. It's like Tyler, I'm getting uh, I'm getting some audio from you here. One second, it just oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, it uh, went bad. Yeah, I I saw it. I heard it too. Um, I was let me just give it a second of silence, and sometimes go to uh, meeting clears itself up. But all right, try it now. You were saying sometimes. Oh, um, yeah, just um, if you're looking at a reference of like a. Uh, a uh, like rocky scree slope and it's like well you know <laughs> most game play environments it's 
you know, the character's going to have to be able to walk across this thing. So how do you convey that in an yeah. interesting way? Um, and uh, but yeah, it's it's just all about the limitations and seeing the limitations as opportunities for creativity uh, rather than um, getting caught up in the mindset of just like, well, we can either do this the right way or it's kind of you know, or you get in this mindset of just like, well, it's just not it's not going to be as good as you want it to be. Okay, cool. Um, I'm still getting the audio thing, so you know it, it yeah. might be um, unreal. Maybe we'll have to skip you the blood and gore. Be, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Didn't think of that. How's that? I just shut it down. It might take a second to come back. It's got to shut down the CPU cycle. Okay, talk to me. Okay, yeah. I, I didn't think of that. Yeah, I shut it down a few seconds ago. How's that? No, mm -hmm. it's not it's still bad. Sorry. Uh, let me ask a. Maybe the wise thing would be uh, just to pop out of the session and then just click and join again. Yeah. Sometimes that does it. Okay. One more sec, guys. There he is. All right, how's that? Much better. All right, so That'd switch you over cool. to the presenter again. Yeah. All right. Cool. Okay. All right. So I guess why don't we um, why don't we start taking a look at some of these images and start talking about um, yeah sure your process if you don't mind uh, let's start with one of your environment pieces if you've got one a little further down. Yeah, of course. Do you want uh, organic or hard surface? Let's start with um, hard surface. Okay. So I'd say, um, let's see here. I got uh, this low poly trim sheet one that mm -hmm. uh, is all about, I mean, this is aiming for something pretty low poly, like a mobile game or um, your like 2012, 2013, uh, like Halo four, I believe it was, mm -hmm. uh, kind of poly count. So there's that one. And there's also, um, I'll go back here, this door, which is a little more modern, I'd say. Yeah, that's a, that's a hefty poly count right there. Um, so yeah, do you want, uh, just as far as the, um, overall like breakdown process, uh, just, just going through, um, yeah, you know, actually, what, what's important to me is, and it's important in the way we structure the boot camps, is this idea of hireability, which is, um, you know, we're not really used to approaching this with art, but, uh, but I like to ask people who are, um, I like to ask people I'm interviewing um, if this kind of concepts make sense. So basically, what we do in the boot camp is we try to focus on the key things, the triggers, let's say, that tell somebody yeah. that this is, they're ready for professional work or they're still an amateur. Like for example, in right. character work, if all you have is ZBrush screen grabs, well, you're nowhere, you know, you're not even close, right? Right. You have to have finished work. And if you have finished work that's done in Marmoset, you know, maybe Substance yeah. Iray, but like definitely Marmoset, uh, yep. then you're at least a candidate. And then the next thing that happens, you know, because everybody says they want to focus on anatomy. I, For me, you know, there's so much clothing that goes on top of a character that the only thing I look at is face, hands. And if the face and hands are done, we know, and if you, I can tell it somebody's level just by looking at the hands. Right. So what are the triggers that makes work look professional in your eyes? I would say, um, yeah, definitely uh, cleanliness. So with hard surface, I would say, cleanliness of edges um, because when you look at um, metallic surfaces mm -hmm. um, a, a big factor too is not just in the normal map but the uh, setup of the soft and hard edges of the uh, of the uh, edges of the polygons yeah. the normal angle mm -hmm. um, because it's all about the bevel <laughs> it's uh, hard surface is all about the bevel yeah 
And so um, I would say maybe there's a better example of this too. Um, but uh, yeah, so. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's getting great. those, yeah, here we go. Getting those bevels, you know, getting that uh, variety because you're not going to get it so much in anatomy, but rather, um, yeah, the quality of the edges catching the light, like right here, if my mouse cursor is mm -hmm. I see in, it. in decent time, yep. uh, catching it right, you know, here. Uh, that's important. And then the second factor, I'd say the second trigger is functionality of uh, understanding how machinery is put together. And uh, with that, it's um, that just goes into uh, just research of, you know, just getting on Pinterest and searching, you know, aircraft, uh, you know, just everyday appliances, um, power tools, you know, the, the, the whole just go through and understand not so much like getting the smorgasbord of like, hey, I'm seeing all these crazy machines and all this stuff, but mm -hmm. understanding the real anatomy of when you're building something out of metal or out of plastic, um, understanding it's like, okay, this amount of weight holds this certain thing. If this right. is, if this piece is jutting out, what's, what's the purpose of that? Every, everything that's built, um, has a sense of purpose to it. It's very like, almost like evolution or something like that, where mm -hmm. it's like, there's no reason you would just put, you know, a big something, uh, that doesn't do anything and just looks cool. That's just not how uh, they build machines because that would be expensive and kind of useless so um it, it's definitely looking into that factor mm -hmm. um th those are the two main ones and then um obviously uh if it's metallic uh the surfacing is going to be super important yeah um or the uh, i should uh, the pbr science uh of metallic versus glossiness and um understanding too uh this this might change it a little bit um too but um the exact science of pbr in game engines is mm -hmm. kind of relative it's really just all about getting the best most convincing result yeah um and it, it was a great shot where it's just like hey we got the official numbers like let's plug them all in and everything should look absolutely photo real and it gets us like 70 percent there i'd say mm -hmm. and then that little bit of tuning after that is um to really get that sense of hey uh this is really showing the shimmer that we need or this is showing the lack of shimmer or it's really showing the contrast of like hey someone spilled some oil or buffed this out or yeah uh, did something to the metallic surface to really get that sheen or lack of sheen right um what are some of the triggers that tell you somebody's not ready right um i would say um uh i would say using polys where they're not needed Okay. Um, this was, this was tricky with this because, uh, you can see it's like, well, there's a bunch of useless loops in this topology. You can see mm -hmm. them here. You can see them here. Yeah. Um, when these assets were being created, uh, we were using, um, we were trying out vertex painting for that. Okay. Uh, uh, so it. that's, that's a whole other, that's a whole other ball game where it's like, well, we need extra resolution that apparently we need these loops that don't really do anything because we need the vertex, uh, resolution so we can paint what we need in there. Uh, so that's why you're seeing these useless loops. So unfortunately, it's kind of a hypocritical do as I say, not as I do, uh, mm -hmm. looking at this image right here. But if I were to go back, it's just like, well, obviously take this out, take this out, take that out, um, uh, take these out. Um, and then uh, from another topology standpoint, um, sloppiness with the uh, angle of the loops and the vertices uh, is a totally. big one. Like keep yeah. everything super snapped to certain axes, like keep everyone with that keep every uh everything just set to that mach machine uh, precision yeah and does that um, count for uh, uvs as well oh yeah yeah definitely with uvs because um again usually unless you're making the weapon that the character is holding like in a first person shooter like it's mm -hmm. probably going to go through a uh, tiling procedural texture yeah. workflow yeah and so you're having just lots of tiling textures going through. And if there's any skewing or strange stuff, um, it's going to look really strange. Uh, the one thing that always confused me was uh, how many UV islands you need. Because when I was working in the mobile games back in the day, they were like, oh, we need as few islands as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but that leads to a huge problem, which is like, well, if we got to sew all these up, we're going to run into problems where the UVs are going to get extremely skewed. So I think yeah. nowadays um, it's just lots of straight, like just up and down side to side if you got to cut edges you got to cut edges um because keeping the uh integrity of the straight up and down uh texture work is super important another th another factor too with that is um if you want to put decals on this stuff um it should just be as simple as like oh i'm just slapping a sticker on this thing right. uh, rather than just like oh how is this gonna you know how do i have to skew this 
in order to get it to meet the UVs uh, accordingly, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And being dependent um, on something like substance painter to do it in a 3D exactly. projector. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. That's usually no bueno. Um, you want to keep it so you can just go into Photoshop and just, just put it down. So talk to me for a second about bevels in the low and the high res. Sure. Because I think this um, is one of the things that gets confusing. And correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the primary shifts I've seen in environment arts is people don't really start with a low res right now. Normally you start with the high res sculpt. Yeah, it's very appealing. Um, but I would say, I mean, with the poly count, even with modern engines, we're still not there yet. And mm -hmm. honestly, um, starting with uh, a low res uh, piece like a box or a cylinder, and then beveling it just enough to where you get like some interesting uh, shapes of it. Like you can see like right here, obviously this isn't a box. So what you take is you get some interest in um, like circling out one section, but you can see here, it's like, it's not that razor sharp box thing. You just take that one, you know, yeah. you take every edge and add either one, uh, one bevel with a uh, angle and then two uh, right angles, or uh, you turn it into a circular uh, cut like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then I would say, because, yeah, this is a very good question as far as, like, well, where do you bevel in polygons and where do you bevel in uh, normal maps? I would say, honestly, um, beveling in polygons um, is probably the way to go, I would say. It yeah. used to be, like, um, I think, yeah, now with modern poly counts and everything like that, I mean, this is this is pretty, this would be, like, a piece of equipment that the character uses, uh, so you'd probably, you know, this wouldn't be like something that's the size of a coffee mug, obviously, or something like that sitting on a desk. This is going to be, you know, like a suitcase or something like that. Yeah, it's going to move around in space. Exactly. This person's yeah. going to move around it. So you need that. Maybe you need that bevel so that the light hits it with just, you know, whatever, a little bit more accuracy. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking at uh, some of the questions here. So, uh, Jan, I would say um, 3DS Max, definitely. I mean, some of the old guys I follow in the industry, like the really uh, – so right now it's kind of split between um, – uh, what is it? Modo. Uh, a lot of people are jumping on Modo, and uh, a lot of people are very comfortable in 3ds Max. Uh, just Modo? That's fascinating. Oh yeah, uh, Torfric. Um, I, I think I'm using the right software. Yeah, Modo. Yeah, um, Torfric, the uh, Wolfenstein guy. Um, and I honestly haven't used Modo, uh, unfortunately, but uh, what I've seen um, is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, it can do some pretty cool stuff. And uh, I mean, when you look at the weapons and equipment in Wolfenstein, I mean, the results speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but um, to, to get back to the beveling question, I'd say the major bevels that have to do with the um, contour of the overall primary shape, um, I would say you probably want to model that um, in, uh, in Maya or in 3DS Max. And then the smaller bevels, like the cut lines, uh, cut lines should just be normal maps, um, I would say, unless it's huge like it's a uh, panel on an aircraft carrier or something like that like the cut lines you're seeing right here and right here I mean that's just all normal map there's no reason to obviously poly model that um, same with like these bevels that are um, parallel to the surface mm -hmm. uh, like these bevels right here that's all normal map um, these rivets are obviously normal map you can uh, look down here and I might go a higher res version of this just so you can kind of see where the bevels are living and yeah, I'd say, I mean, obviously there's a lot of loops to take out and um, uh, there are some techniques. There's like a script you can run in 3ds Max. It's been a while, but you don't have to use this middle loop. So you can save a lot of polys there. Um, and I wish I could really uh, remember the name of it, but uh, but there's a better example right there of just like, yeah, that's enough of a bevel to indicate, you know, what the overall primary shape is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, looking at this now, I can see like where you can really trim a lot of the fat. Like that's way too many. So again, uh, <laughs> I'll be, I'll be the example here of just like this is way too many sides to this cylinder right here. Um, yeah, you but just I, need I, enough. Um, to... Part of it too is there's a. Um, I think it's important to that people understand, especially the students, that you know there's a oh, part yeah. of it which is you're in the mix. You got to get this done. And right. you know what? A hundred polygons nowadays, it probably doesn't make an impact. That is very true. Yeah. So, it's, so um, that's one thing. But then the way I like to talk to the boot campers about um, uh, the what their work should be like is, you know, you got to think there's the first date. You got to get that job. So uh -huh. you got to wear the nice yeah, shirt. Yeah. 
Um, to answer uh, what is a cut line, a cut line is um, these, uh, if I zoom in here, it's these uh, panel cuts right here where uh, the panels of the machinery have been uh, fused together or not fused, sorry, um, assembled together and then uh, either latched together or bolted together. Um, but it's uh, it's the paneling that makes up um, the overall shell of a uh, outer casing, be it an airplane or a metal box or something like that. That's what a cut line is. Got it. Yep. All right. So uh, in terms of the bevel in the normal or in uh, the geometry, you know, for the most part, norm in the geometry is pretty okay. Yeah, I would say. And um, to get that little bit of extra detail, I would say what I do as well is um, I will take these shells into ZBrush. I will duplicate or I will um, get them to like a high res uh, piece. And I should probably just um, explain this uh, visually because it's going to be pretty hard to explain. And I, I apologize if my audio uh, tanks again. If you don't want me to risk it, Ryan, let me know. I'll, uh, risk, I'll quit risk. out. We're all about risk and reward here. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah, I might just uh, explain this visually because it might be a little tough to convey just with words. But uh, what it consists of is um, uh, taking the hard, uh, the hard geometry out of 3ds Max or Maya once it's kind of all assembled, mm -hmm. and then um, duplicating it, or not duplicating. I'm sorry, dividing it uh, to a high enough res, and then decimating it to where you get that tiny little uh, lip of form change. So even on the tiny uh, level, there's not that sharp edge. Mm -hmm. And then that's my high res that I bake the normal map from. Um, so that's how you get like uh, that really like nice uh, fine detail there. Um, and I do that with a lot of my machinery is, uh, yeah, I do still bake from a high res and put it into my normal map. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's only doing a tertiary uh, feature. It's not carrying the load of just like, oh, it's got to convey the whole like bevel change in the uh, overall form, mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It does. All right, so are you, are you opening up another program? Yeah, I'm opening up ZBrush. Uh, let me know if um, the audio starts to suffer. Okay, no worries. Yeah, okay. So it would be something like, let me find a square here. So obviously, here's your razor sharp, like polygon right here. Um, so what I would be doing is taking it in, uh, turning off smooth, hitting divide like one, two, maybe three times, and then dividing it so you get that nice fall off edge right there. Mm -hmm. And then um, what I might do sometimes as well is uh, you can dynamesh it if you want uh, to get a... Uh, uh, I hope I didn't too, choose too high of a resolution there. If not, I can always quit out. And I realized too, that might uh, tank my CPU, so. Mm. No, the audio uh, seems to be fine, so. Okay, cool, awesome. Um, but yeah, uh, I use that too with uh, certain uh, aspects, like if you have a circular cut and a um, square cut, yeah. um, it gets a little intricate where like uh, the faceting, you, you don't wanna keep the faceting of um, like a circular uh, cut on a uh, piece of like, if you, um, an example of this would be like a square with a circular hole cut in it. That, that's so obviously this gonna would... become a normal map. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or uh, sometimes if the shape is big enough, you need to have it be geo. And with that, right. um, you have to kind of do an interesting thing where like you put down specific loops, like you take in your uh, low res geo and then you place down strategically, you place down loops so that uh, when you divide, when you smooth it up, um, you're not like destroying the hard edges of the uh, square or right angle parts, but you're mm -hmm. also not like faceting up the uh, circular uh, cut. Um, and again, that's kind of tough to uh, visualize, but um, uh, I might be able to throw something together. Um, well, uh, it sounds like we got to somehow or another talk you into a class because. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we got to see. Yeah, um, <laughs> some great information here, and I love the way that you're presenting this because you're thinking it through from a teaching perspective. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, it's, in, in yeah. a process. Do you find that that's something that helps you in your job as as an artist? You know, do you find that you um, this element of teaching that you're doing right now does that help you with your uh, with your team and things of that nature? 
Yeah, um, I would say because I'm, I'm trying to get better at that skill set of like catching myself where it's just like, OK, I just said a bunch of tech jargon, like did that, you know, <laughs> honestly, I would say like the best uh, the best way to test that out is just talk to someone who isn't in the industry and explain mm. what you do. And that's a great check as far as like, oh, like I'm being way too abstract with what I'm talking about here mm -hmm. or like uh, like just tell the grandparents at Thanksgiving dinner, like what you do in your day to day job oh, if you're not yeah. under NDA. Yeah. And if they just say it's like I just I have no idea what you're talking about. It's like, OK, I need to elaborate more. Yeah, well, I think you um, could still tell them even if you were under NDA because it's still a non-disclosure. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't get any yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just Dynamesh. Um, it's uh Oh, uh, I forgot another reason why Dynamesh is um, if you want to uh, place down, this is super important, if you want to place down any um, alphas that you have in ZBrush, like, uh, let me see here if I have anything just for hard surface. I might not here, but uh, hypothetically, if you wanted to drag and drop like any of the um, pieces like this or this, uh, I do that like crazy in ZBrush. And mm -hmm. if you have uh, something that divides, like that, obviously, you're going to run into problems with your uh, resolution. So that's a huge reason why I Dynamesh, um, my hard surface, uh, high res assets is that you have all this awesome, you know, just consistent, all those consistent quads. So you can just drag uh, whatever little hard surface alpha you want on top of this, and it's going to bake perfectly. Mm. Now, how come, um, why not just use Turbo Smooth to get the edges? Oh, uh, you mean like, uh, oh, you, you do Turbo Smooth to get the edges and then you Dynamesh. So, okay, um, yeah, because hypothetically, you can Turbo Smooth, but um, if you have, uh, if you just divide it up, but if you have a piece like this, what my mouse cursor is over, you're going to have all these weird elongated rectangles mm -hmm. and the alpha might come out looking a little janky. Uh, whereas okay. it, with if you Dynamesh it, you have just consistent, nice, like high res quads all over the place. Uh, so right. So that the vertices. Uh, or calculating the normal to hit in the right surface, things like that. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I yeah, yeah. So and you're, I, you're usually, creating a, a tighter container for the normal. Map. Right. And when I do a uh, hard surface detailing in ZBrush, just dragging out alphas, I honestly just, um, I almost always just do that on uh, flat uh, parallel surfaces such as this. Um, I try to stay away. Well, yeah, I, I try my best to stay away from stuff like that because it gets a little tough sometimes. I yeah. try to, whenever there's like a change in the silhouette, um, you kind of want to be in the driver's seat and poly modeling that because this is where the, this is where uh, the biggest normal map uh, headaches and problems always arise is this mm -hmm. part. Um, this is pretty fun and easy. It's just like, well, the normal map's just going to bake fine because uh, it's just a flat, you know, yep. hard surface. Yep. And that's where you can just go to town and know it's all going to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So, okay. So I think I want to unpack this for a second and, um, and sure. be clear, especially for the, uh, for the environment guys that are in here. Um, first off, let me ask those of you who are here, uh, and I'll make sure I'm looking at those who are watching it on the guild live. I think Corinne's on the guild. So, uh, did, did that make sense that the, one of the tricks that Tyler's using is he takes the high res you know, normal, you know, turbo smooth, do all that stuff that you normally do, but he takes that into ZBrush, dynameshes it so that's a more of a watertight, if I could say that, container for the normal map to generate, and then also adds cut adds elements, like um, some alphas and some shapes, you know, that maybe would have been a pain to model. Does that make sense? Yeah. Give me a yes or no, guys. Totally, Paul. And I, yeah. I just want to see if there's any no's. And uh, Sari is saying, yes, I wish I had done it that way. Yeah, Sari, this is a new workflow for me as well, so I think it's quite fascinating. Um, and it definitely uses the most, uh, uses ZBrush for really what it's great for. Uh, Edison's got this, yes. Danny makes sense, just throws me off, which means you're a little confused, so I get that. Um, and uh, Jan, would that be the way to do the dragon sculpt on my lamp? Jan, Jan yes, I agree. Yes, absolutely, that would be the way to do it. Um, okay, yes, Ira didn't know that before. Uh, okay, great. All right, thank you. All right, so that answers that kind of question, which is really I've been trying to dive into some of the triggers for um, what's going to help somebody get hired and what's going to hurt somebody from getting hired. And we found this neat little cool trick. So let's take a look, um, if you don't mind, Tyler, at uh, – let's go back sure. to your art station. Yeah. 
Uh, and then uh, let's just take a look at your character work. Oh, no, sorry. The organic is what I wanted to look at next because that's the next field. Like I understand hard surface and it's a little bit tighter in terms of what people expect. Totally, yeah. But you go into organic and it's like, um, you know, totally different universe. So yeah, how does somebody present their work? Um, and it's not really present their work. What I'm really looking for is when somebody is being hired for, let's say, world building. Right. What decides if a work is actually, a, you know, help somebody be a candidate for a job or really just showcases that they just know how to use, you know, some terrain generator? Sure. What I would say is um, when you go into world building now, every texture needs to be tiled pretty much unless it's a decal. Um, so you need to know how to do tiling textures. And obviously a substance designer has really taken over that field. Yeah. Um, I like to, uh, here, here's kind of the weird thing about me. I, I use substance designer, but I actually prefer to just use the um, X nano mesh or the tiling nano mesh plugin in ZBrush huh. and generate my tiling textures that way. Huh. Or if I'm feeling really masochistic, I can uh, <laughs> just bake out a, um, just a tile and then tile it the old fashioned way in Photoshop with uh -huh. um, doing the offset and the uh, masking and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, now, obviously like, yes, yeah, substance designer is the new, uh, is the brave new way of um, generating that stuff. But I'd say, and Melissa, I think going back to her, she has a good philosophy of like, look, you just, you use the best of the two. Yeah. Um, I mean, you just, there's no, there's no like, uh, uh, aspect of like you either got to be with one software or another. It's like, hey, if you got, you know, a height map that you like making in ZBrush and then you'll take it in the Substance Designer and make it tile, uh, apply what you need. Um, and going back, uh, yeah, so I would say with environment organic work, um, it's about uh, the flexibility of taking almost any uh, environment, uh, making it tile because it's going to go across, you know, these big square kilometers of, you know, terrain and stuff like that. And uh, also making them extremely flexible because it's like, well, you know, we want to have it rain and have puddles form in the dirt, or we want to have, you know, uh, good height maps. So, you know, grass can grow into the pebbles or um, uh, so, so just aspects like that. And just um, the other thing that's really tricky, and this is still frustrating for me, is um, finding that balance between unique looking ground textures that uh, unfortunately start to tile after a while because the, the catch 22 is the more pretty and unique and portfolio piece looking your ground texture is, mm -hmm. the more you're gonna get that wallpaper effect when it starts to tile across the land. Um, but that's a problem because it's like, well, I don't wanna make a super bland blah looking like ground texture, but it tiles nice and seamlessly. Like if you go up, you can't even, you know, see a tile, but it's like, well, it's very, very vanilla and um, just kind of, uh, there's nothing really special about it. So what I would say is for portfolio pieces, just, um, uh, I would say have your, here's what I would do is I'd, I hear two pieces that I think that would be good is one that's diorama based okay. that you could like set up in Marmoset as like a little tiny diorama that showcases you took your little, you know, beautiful corner slice of life aspect of, you know, a mountainside or a beach or whatever like that and place that and really go to town with like the detail of that. Mm -hmm. But then um, show like a wide open shot, uh, okay. something like, uh, eh, let me see here. Yeah, something like this or something that shows, you know, a big mountainside or something like that and show your textures working uh, from a tiling perspective across the board. Um, and some of these, like, you know, here's, here's a good example. Um, and the other thing too, that's kind of tricky, UE4 does this extremely well, where um, you can uh, have different resolutions of a ground tiling texture Yeah. Uh, that's based around camera distance. So this is super essential to have in a large environment, which is, you know, you want to have the mountains look like mountains. You want a very specific like world machine generated texture. I would say too, world machine and geoglyph, um, super good to know if you want to do natural organic stuff. Um, it's very, very uh, fun stuff to use. Uh, so you want, yeah, that specific like mountain like texture on a scale of, uh, I suppose that'd be like one to one size. Mm -hmm. And then, um, 
have it uh, turn into a tiling ground texture. So it's you know very high res under your feet. And how you do that is um, you have different resolutions of a ground texture um, that's based around camera distance. So once it reaches like 500 meters from the camera, it switches to another resolution. Or okay. if it's you know 10,000 meters from the camera, it switches to another resolution. So 10,000 meters away from the camera, it has a tiling resolution of one. Okay. Uh, 500 meters from the camera has a resolution of like uh, eight or something like that. And that's what you're seeing here. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's pretty tedious and involves a lot of, uh, it uh, requires a pretty um, strenuous setup. But once you get the material going, it's like, well, you just, now you just swap, you know, whatever textures you want. It's all working in the game engine. Now, granted, I've only done this in UE4. Yeah. Um, it, Unity, I haven't tried it. Uh, and if your company is using a specific engine, they'll just teach you how to do it, you know, that way. Yeah, we actually have a so, class coming up on um, uh, on something similar with organic world building, really. Uh, yeah, but we're using yeah. CryEngine, the new one, not the four, not Lumberyard that Amazon bought. Right, we're right. using five yeah. because, you know, it's just so much more plug and play uh, yeah. in terms of the materials. Like Unreal is super powerful. But I don't know if this is your experience as well. But there's just a lot of setup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a it's sort of a trade off of like yes, you can essentially do almost anything you want. Yeah. Uh, but the problem is, yeah, you have to start with a big old node base and everything. And yeah. Uh, so so that's the trade off of it. And whereas if you just want to plug and play, which I think if you're starting out. Um, that might that might be a good way to go because you're you're focusing more on the fundamentals and making the piece look good and making it work with the engine rather than like showcasing like hey I know how to set up an entire you know <laughs> yeah. material yeah it's like substance UE4. designer versus substance painter yeah. you know substance painter right, you just right. layers you, but in substance designer you start with like a a square <laughs> or, yep. or yep. a noise or a, yep. whatever right but it's super powerful yep. yeah um, so Isaac uh, I have a question about world machine. Um, oh, let's add, let's yeah, add, repeat I mean, the question real quick, just in case people are watching this later. Uh, so yeah. Isaac is saying, I have a question about World Machine. Is there a specific artist for creating terrains um, uh, that could take that role? Uh, sometimes. Uh, if a project's big enough, if you're making an open world, an open world game, I mean, everyone's going to touch it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I would say... Uh, to, to be honest, it's more about like uh, how many licenses of World Machine you can buy. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> who uh, who gets the World Machine job just because we have the one license that we can <laughs> use. But uh, um, I, I'd say someone who has a huge passion for geology uh, is probably going to be the one to get it. Hmm. Uh, where it's like, yeah, erosion works this way, terracing works this way. And also uh, someone who really understands, here's a big factor, is... Um, World Machine spits out these really beautiful looking mountainsides and stuff. But when you apply that, when you apply the geo of that to a piece of landscape terrain and it's the size of like 10 square kilometers, it's going to look really bad. Uh, and what I mean by that, elaborating on that is um, there's going to be jaggies and sawtoothing everywhere because mm -hmm. there simply just isn't enough um, resolution uh, from a player scale to get that, you know, real world replicate, uh, replication of, um, all that, like, you know, scree detail and mountainside detail and stuff like that. So honestly, most terrain of what you're seeing in a game engine looks very pillowy and smooth. Um, and how you're getting like, uh, let me find it again. How you're getting the effect of what you're seeing uh, in the piece I was doing is from the texture map and the normal map, not okay. the uh, actual geo. Okay. Uh, so you bake out from World Machine. You can either like uh, bake from a high res that you got out of World Machine or just the normal map in general. But uh, all that detail that you're seeing there is coming from a normal map and a diffuse map. But you want the geo to be pretty smooth um, for collision purposes. Okay. Um, and uh, I did not use True Sky. I was just using uh, just using the UE4. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, atmospheric light or atmospheric fog, and then uh, just using some cloud cards. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there was a couple of other questions up here. Um, yeah, I missed them. Yeah, and guys, keep in mind uh, that you'll get. That we will open a Q and A. So I appreciate. Uh, Jan, you have like about 15 questions in there, so we'll get to them. 
uh, and uh, especially if uh, if we start to kind of pass it. So, uh, all right, let's take a look at the um, the art station again. All right, so uh, and we're heading towards the end of our time, so I'm going to do this for a couple more minutes, and then we'll open this up for Q and A. Um, we sure. only kind of have Tyler for like about an hour, or so. Um, so, what is it in your view that makes uh, a character work successful? What is it that you are um, not necessarily that you're working on, but that you think somebody uh, uh, who's doing character work uh, that really catches yes. your attention? I would say um, understanding shape composition and mm. rhythm. Mm, that's um, brilliant. Are I see that in your essential. work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, honestly, what I've been really looking at um, is uh, The Illusion of Life, that old uh, Disney Studio book. Mm hmm. And when you look at uh, that, I think like clarifies it the most is when you see drawings by like Fred Moore or Milk Call from you know way back in the day, and all the shape language, all the detail composition, all the value composition, it uh, is all about movement and rhythm because environments are static. Environments don't really move, so it's more about like the arranging of either epic scope mm -hmm. or overall daunting feeling of a place. But everything can be pretty. Static and not really connect if that makes sense. Not always, but totally. uh, there's definitely a lot more of that. Whereas with characters, everything from the anatomy to the costume to the color to the emotion um, to one one big factor. Uh, if you're being a and I'm still really trying to work hard on this is with a character creature artist is when you pose it, um, the pose really has to work with the um, work with the character like i think like this might be a bad example where it's a little bit stiff uh whereas you know i'm trying harder to get stuff that uh like uh this fox here that you know there's a lot more movement and rhythm or, the, or this guy right here uh, i was working really hard of just like yeah you really want to get that frazetta movement that rhythm going through uh mm -hmm. now granted uh that i think i sidetracked a little bit and i'm focusing more from an illustration perspective but uh, for something that's going to get rigged, obviously, you're working in a stiff T-pose, but um, what you can see in a lot of good character concept art is that their costume, their uh, overall silhouette, it all has this great sense of movement and uh, uh, almost like harmony. There, there was a great, um, when I was reading up on Mooka, and he said what made Mooka so amazing was... Uh, this is he understood the uh, Art Nouveau uh, artist yes, in the, uh, the Czech artist. He, Yes, yes. Um, what made his work so amazing was he um, really studied and understood musical harmony. Mm. Uh, and uh, he, now a historian said that, so I'm not sure if it's true, but uh, right. he uh, channeled that very much into his work. And I mean, everyone, everyone copies Mooka. Like he's probably the most copied artist uh, nowadays, I'd say, aside from maybe Frazetta. Oh, man. And you what he understood. I never thought about that, but you're right, especially in terms of the illustration. Yeah. Um, in our in our space, you know, specifically, not yeah. like, you know, Chuck Close fine art, but in our space. That's great. That's true. Uh, yeah. All right. Last question that I got for you, and then I'm going to um, get about two or three more questions from other people. Uh, sure, so please sure. ask your questions uh, now. And if you asked them before, just repeat them. Uh, so the uh, how do you keep yourself motivated to produce this work? Because you've got a lot of work. I would say, yeah. Um, luckily, sorry, sorry, I don't want to eat up time like thinking how to say this. Um, what, one thing I've honestly been uh, thinking of is starting a webinar that comes to the psychological aspect of finding the motivation to do work. Mm -hmm. And because uh, what I tell people when I'm like at the bar, when I'm, you know, in bars with people or just meeting people, and it's like, well, how do you do it? It's like, well, this is my doing art is my video games it's my drinking it's my weed it's mm -hmm. my uh going out and socializing yeah um and i want to delve more into that with the psychological aspect of like well how do you get that because if um doing this kind of work drains you the same way doing a uh, day job does and you really feel rejuvenated and relaxed when you're you know uh playing something or yeah. just vegging in front of netflix or something like that that's a big problem and so uh yeah, I mean, to, to keep doing it, I mean, well, honestly, just, I mean, being inspired by the work I see on ArtStation, I mean, you'll never, ever be able to put your feet up and say, oh, man, like, you know, I did it all because just one second on ArtStation and you're just like, oh, my God, the entire, you know, because ArtStation is a 
portal to the planet of artists pretty much um and <laughs> you know but i think just... the the key point there is for me anyways um yeah. how do you get yourself inspired by art station yes as opposed to you know feeling intimidated yeah yeah um i would say uh it's it's that old quote by andrew loomis it's um 10 percent how you draw and 90 percent what you draw mm. And I would say the the factor is knowing that you're going to always subconsciously put your style and your spin on uh, a piece that you do. Yeah. Uh, I think that's another factor too is um, you can, I, I did this definitely and there's a lot of students that uh, spend a lot of time thinking I need to force my style. I need to make this more my style. I need to make it have more personality or more um, unique or more, you know, innovative and uh, i would say like that always comes kind of subconsciously um now i can only speak from my own experience but uh that is definitely what i have found and uh, i mean i mean honestly of just like always having that urge to uh be inspired and go do work i mean i'm i'm honestly uh i think it's just that sense of just like hey like i haven't done a bird in a while or i haven't done a seal or i haven't done a fish like i wonder how i can put my spin on that Mm -hmm. um that's that's always the mindset i have or like i haven't done or like i'll go out i mean i live in the pacific northwest so like you know i'll go out and see a really great beach or river or something and that's where you're seeing these pieces right here is like how do you put you know some kind of cool spin on the day at the beach or mm -hmm. being by a river or being out in the desert or something like that um that that's definitely i, I hope that i hope that answers uh the question okay it does but i think one of the key things that um that's part of that is you have a trust in your process and you have a trust yes. in yourself. And that's something that for those who get intimidated, they're lacking. So as you go through this, cause I would love to see a, a webinar or talk by you on that. Um, sure. I think one of the key things for us all to answer is, you know, on that spectrum of going from intimidated to inspired, you know, how can we help ourselves trust our process? Right. And uh, yeah, I would say, um, what's nice about game art is you can kind of have this very clear finish line, which is, Hey, the poly count's decent. The texture map is there. It's like on a pedestal in Marmoset. Um, that's kind of a nice like end goal and it puts you in a good mindset of just like, well, that's when the piece is finished. So honestly, like, and I'll be honest with like a lot of these like creature pieces and stuff like that. I do cut corners with the topology and with the UVs just because I care more about the illustration than the end results of the, uh, which again, do as I say, not as I do. Um, there's definitely pieces on here that showcase like, Hey, I know how to do topology. I know how to, you know, work with uh, technical uh, animators and stuff like that. But what I would say is that luckily with game art, aside from maybe like illustration or um, film art is you have this end result, which is like, yeah, it's in Marmoset. It's got texture maps it's got a decent poly count. So that's always the finish line. And then uh, you can always, and, and because of that, you can never be like, well, this is halfway done or this is like, uh, so, so I just get myself in that mental mindset of just like, well, you we have to take it all the way to the end. Yeah. Um, you can't just have like, well, here's sort of a, a half done zebra sculpture. Um, I'll do a render. I'll put it on Instagram or my art station. That's why I kind of like art station, honestly, because Instagram, I think coddles a little bit too much with uh, work in progress stuff. Totally. Uh, nothing against, I think Instagram is wonderful, but uh, I, I do see that where like Instagram is more about the process of uh, doing the thing uh, rather than the end result, which is why I think art station is kind of a nice thing when you're starting out to um, go with, because on art station, you really don't want to put uh, work in progress uh, pieces up there. Yep. That makes total sense. And I think one of the key things that you said there is that you finish pieces. Yes. As you opposed have to, to leaving them unfinished. And if and I've experienced this myself. If I leave enough things unfinished, I, I'll start to doubt. I'll start to be, you know, it's well, great here's anxiety. The gr yeah. Here's the great thing is you can always go back and redo. I still do yeah. that. Um, I did that yesterday where it's like, because that's the factor too. And it's kind of a great fire to light under your, under you is, mm -hmm. um, you'll push through, you'll put it up. You won't hesitate to like jump off the diving board. You'll like rush because I've done this. I've like rushed through. I'll get on art station and be like, Oh God, I got to redo that. And it's on my art station. I need to do, <laughs> I need to uh, yeah. go back and redo it. Cause it's up there. Like, uh, cause it's a great kind of like self-motivating like thing of uh, 
you, you always finish the piece, even if the piece is not very good, then you just have this brand new goal that will be even more like burning and desirable, which is like, well, I need to redo the piece and make it better because it's sitting up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, that that works for me. Um, and I'm not sure, uh, you know, uh, it, it might work for some people, it might not work for some people, but it's definitely worked for me. Cool. All right, let's get a couple more questions. Uh, Jan, I'm going to combine yours and Kyle's question. So uh, Kyle was asking about when you were doing that ZBrush demo. So after adding alphas in ZBrush, do you re-dynamesh? Or... Um, you don't have to. You can if you want. Um, usually uh, when I bake, I use XNormal, and I just uh, set the edges to hard, so that usually um, takes care of everything. If you um, What you don't want is to ever have... Uh, jaggies uh which would be something like that's kind of a decent example right there like something like that yeah got it um and that's tricky like you sometimes these high res meshes for my hard surface stuff is like 12 million polygons uh so it does get a little heavy sometimes but i just kind of uh go through it yeah you know, just kind of do what i gotta do um got so it. uh yeah yeah and then uh, Jane is asking for your illustrative pieces. Where do you render them? Um, Marmoset. Marmoset. So these models, yes. yeah. Inside of Marmoset. There you go. And she's asking about how you get the color and illustrative finish. I'm assuming that that's actually a class. So I'm not. I'm not assuming you have a quick answer on that. <laughs> oh, to get good color. Yeah. Um, any tips on how somebody? Because these are very well presented pieces, right? Yeah, I would say. Um, Color comes, oof, I'll, I'll try to do it as shotgun style as I can. So I poly paint and ZBrush. Mm -hmm. um, I don't rely on, here, here's the thing. Most of the color what you're seeing is poly painted in ZBrush. I don't use Substance Painter too often. Um, then I uh, use the color of the lights in Marmoset. Uh, one factor is your lights in Marmoset have color to them. And that's mm -hmm. a huge factor. If you take a painting class, you realize like, oh, the color of the light influences uh, what the end result is going to be. And then another factor is there's a great uh, material in Marmoset, which is the subsurface scattering shader, uh, which has uh, a fuzz feature, which um, creates this little Fresnel effect. And uh, it uh, also turn has that like gummy bear um, effect to it too. And that can mm -hmm. be its own specific color. So that's kind of what you're seeing. Like with the color, color temperature you're seeing here going from like a deep purple to a bright hot pink that's the subsurface uh, shader and messing with that as well as probably like having good local color of uh, pinks and stuff on the uh, shell here and then probably having a uh, light turquoise blue um, color of the light that's shining yeah. on this guy so color is very very complicated uh, but there's kind of the three factors is you have a lot more at your disposal um, yeah. than you think you do it took me a while to figure that out awesome that is awesome. All right, my friend, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, it was it was great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and, uh, and I learned a lot. So guys, in, uh, head over to the guild. Tell me one thing you learned from this so I can make sure I get this over to Tyler. And uh, have a fantastic day. I will see the character guys here in just a little bit at their link, not this link, but the, the link that's for them. And uh, Tyler, again, man, so glad. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. All right, take care of yourselves. You too. All right, bye. Everybody.